Welcome, everybody. Today's webinar is titled Cracking the Case on Open USD: How to Achieve Glorious 3D Interoperability. We're so excited to have you all here. Uh, quick intro, I thought I would introduce myself. My name is Jordan Gibney. I joined Autodesk back in 2017. Prior to that, I worked as a 3D animator throughout the Pacific Northwest on video games, television, commercials, that sort of stuff. Um, I joined the support team in 2017, focused specifically on Maya, moved up into management for a few years, and then switched to internal training and enablement. And now I sit in a sales position as a solutions engineer. For this webinar, I will do a quick high-level overview of what USD is, and then we'll turn it over to my co-host, Sean Olson, who's going to do some live demos of USD in action. So it'll be really fun. Let's get started. All right, so USD, it stands for Universal Scene Description. You may have heard rumblings of this uh, throughout the industry, but we'll make sure to cover, like I said, what it is, where it came from, Autodesk's involvement, and how we got to where we are today. And then Sean will take it over from there. By definition, USD is an open source file format, framework, compiling engine, and platform, all for non-destructive workflows involving 3D data. And that 3D data isn't limited to media and entertainment software like 3ds Max and Maya. It includes every digital creation tool or DCC. Um, originally developed by Pixar in 2010, it was made open source in 2016. And I know that maybe open source might not be a super clear concept, so we'll, cover, we'll go over what that is real quick too. Um, in a modern open source software, it's defined as anything, any code that is available to the public to see, modify, or use, meaning it's developed completely in transparency. There's nothing hidden, no agendas, no milestones that are not documented in a public manner. And there's three contemporary pillars of that open source project. The first being rules and regulations. Uh, the open source projects generally flow, follow excuse me, a set of guiding, guidelines, like working in a public manner, maintaining appropriate securities, documentations. And these rules are often defined by a third party to prevent bias. For example, in 1998, the Open Source Initiative, or OSI, was established to do just that. But that's not to say that there weren't open source projects uh, before that. They just might not have followed those exact guidelines. Those guidelines being defining methods for developers to share code, transfer knowledge, and work together. They also created a definition of baseline functionality. And any open source project that wants that level of credibility will follow those rules. You can find those rules as well as more definitions on opensource.org. The second pillar is an environment where all of the development efforts can be publicly viewed. That's where repositories come into play, like um, GitHub and Bitbucket. Those all contain the project goals, documentation, project tracking, and communications throughout the, the lifespan of the project. And the final pillar is support and standardization. Um, to validate the efforts and validate the software as it's supposed to function, a third party company will confirm that it, it does all of that and sort of put their stamp of approval on it at the end of it all. For USD specifically as an open source project, like I said, it was made uh, initially by Pixar in 2010. It was used on the production of Brave and used since then in various ways on the projects after that. In 2016, it was made open source made publicly available, not just to M&E customers, by the way, to everyone. So there has been some interest outside of M&E too. In 2023, Autodesk made their USD plugins for Max and Maya. And then most recently, um, in actually of August of last year, Autodesk joined forces with some pretty cool other players who were interested to make the Alliance for Open USD or AOUSD. Like I said, it was announced at SIGGRAPH. Those videos are available online. So if you want to see the full speech, go ahead and check it out there. Uh, the players involved are Pixar, Apple, NVIDIA, Adobe, and the Joint Development Foundation. The Joint Development Foundation is a third-party company, but their role is to make sure that there's equality among all of these groups because um, we're all super eager to see USD succeed and develop quickly. Their official definition from their website is to provide a corporate and legal infrastructure to enable groups to quickly establish and operate lightweight collaborations to develop technical specification standards and source code. So what that means is that it's taking all of the interests of each of these groups to make sure that they are all being met in an equal manner and no one part of this alliance gets priority treatment over the other. Um, additionally, the team 
agreed on some mutually beneficial goalposts to focus on throughout the project development. The first being thorough documentation. The USD site um, has their own set of, of documentation as well as each individual group's documentation on their own websites. And those are catered to their audience to make sure that those needs are met appropriately. The second is an active and transparent forum. Just like any open source project, they wanna make sure that milestones and communications are all publicly available and um, nothing comes as a surprise to folks as, as this project goes on. And the third is to achieve that third party recognition from an international organization for standardization. Um, it's a big one. They want that stamp of approval. On, in addition to those goals, they agreed that we were trying to solve three primary challenges within 3D production. The first being simplifying pipeline workflows. It acts as a central platform for all tools, file types, data, and all of it to be collected and represented accurately without additional stressors or steps. The second is speed, and that speed ensures that artists, reviewers, and developers can all work together in real time and move to the next stage of production faster. That speed is a core element of the uh, USD development across the board. And then the third, along with speed, an emphasis on non-destructive workflows to increase the ability for artists to work simultaneously while reducing the likelihood of data getting lost, corrupted, saved over, all of those really scary situations. To clarify though, USD is not just another FBX or OBJ. The compiler engine, compiler engine aspect is the real power. It brings USD data in, as well as other native file types from any DCC program and represents that data accurately with speed, lightweight, and highly performing um, results. It's also not replacing or deprecating any existing workflows. You can still model texture, light, and work in your scene just the way that you have been. USD is meant to leverage the successes of those developments that we've achieved over years and make it even better and easier to work. To further illustrate that point, this image is from the uh, USD documentation from the Pixar website. And we're probably all very familiar with this, but I thought it was a really nice snapshot that simplifies where, pre where production um, hits different points of, of a project. Um, we all know that without within this project, there's the potential for folks to use a different tool, export a different file type, use different versions of the same software. And that can cause issues with converting, assembling pieces together, and even cause some general troubleshooting or compatibility issues that require additional work on top of it. Not to mention there's some linearness in this workflow where one department is waiting for another to finish before they can do their part. And it's been that way forever. So it may not be something that we even recognize could change or could improve. But if we look at USD in its very base format, simply using it as a file format, we're already reducing a lot of those potential hazards and hangups in a production. By saving out USD data in all of these various phases, that eliminates the compatibility issues, the assembly issues, the corruption issues, all of that gets negated because we're using the same file format. And within that data, the extra bonus is that there's the opportunity to link object variants. So think of like a chair with a different color or a different shaped armrest. All of that is linked within a single file that is again, lightweight performant and gets compiled rather than referenced in a heavy data situation. This image is from our very own Autodesk documentation on USD and it illustrates the layering system of USD, which again, brings a lot of the power of keeping things super lightweight and fast. The USD framework acts as a descriptor engine platform that brings all of those data sets together including the variants and layers and working together to make sure that the scene data or scene graph calculations stays protected and non-destructed. Um, and then it breaks it down into smaller pieces, which has a direct correlation to that speed. And it gives artists additional control on what they are loading into the scene while they're working. So that there's less clutter, less machine power dedicated to things that have no impact on the piece that they're working on. Again, we're not losing the ability to reference or cache data, USD has mechanisms to support that native data in addition to USD. It plays all nicely together. And then again, what we're gaining is the non-destructive editing within those layers and variants so that every artist can work in their preferred tool and not have to worry about accurate representation when all compiled together. This documentation is available online and gets updates and republished with every release of Maya and Max. 
um, you can find it online and keep tabs on it. And to be, to be clear, the USD open source project is not the only project that we're involved in. These are some of the other ones that we had our hands in as well. Our investment in open source projects is an example of an industry-wide movement prioritizing open source projects. Um, Autodesk as a whole is in the business of supporting creative people. So we want to continue to do that through open source projects because we believe that they are direct representations of the industry and where we're headed. The list of open source projects is ever growing. And we'll say that we have to be cognizant of which projects we're getting involved in. Um, and we want to make sure that the ones that we are involved in are in alignment with our efforts internally. USD specifically within that scope um, has these four projects as the core strategic focus going forward. Um, every development decision we have going forward will be made with the support of open source projects as a foundation. We view them as key enablers for future workflows and we've been a part of growing and supporting these standards for years. However, USD has set a brand new precedent on speed and collaboration among other DCC tools. And we're really excited about, to, about where that will head in the future. Ultimately, with these investments in open source projects, we want to move from individual components to complete workflows involving our tools as well as ex external tools too. So at this point, it's probably obvious, but USD benefits everyone and it's in everyone's best interest to get on board with it. We're evening the playing field across all of these tools and allowing them to bring their best tools to the table in a way that is collaborative and non-destructive. And it will allow the productions to be elevated as a whole because no one has to worry about weird egos or ownership or anything like that. It's an even playing field. And that doesn't stop with scene graph assembly. It also um, carries over into the rendering aspect of production. And that's where Hydra comes into play. Hydra, the best definition of Hydra is from Pixar's documentation. It connects scene delegates that consume data and render delegates, which send scene data to particular renderers in such a way that render and scene delegates can be mixed and matched as applications as the consumer's needs dictate. Hydra was originally bundled with USD as a single project, but it was pulled out and made independent to keep uh, development efforts clean. And you may wonder why we are investing in Hydra. Why not just develop our own system? And the easy answer is we were jazzed about USD and we we're going to be jazzed about Hydra because we want to be involved in the entire experience of the USD ecosystem. Um, Hydra supports native data on top of USD data. So just like USD, it's inclusive and branches out beyond just the ME space. We can also leverage Hydra at a company-wide level, which is really exciting. We can use it in manufacturing, architecture, automotive, and other industries. These scene delegate programs can be Max Maya or anything else that you see on the screen, as well as stuff that's not on the screen too. Uh, Hydra is serving as a common framework for 3D parties and other applications, serving, um, serving the ability and desire to mix native data and USD together. And this is critical because we want the USD journey to not slow down production. It should be fun and easy and exciting, even in the testing phase. But what's a render without some great materials, right? So uh, the other sub layer of that topic is keeping in theme with the open source project and one love teamwork, all that good stuff by supporting Material X, which is an open source project itself. And it's the center of our material strategy at Autodesk. Material X is a rich material and look development representation across applications and renderers. It was initially created by Industrial Light and Magic in 2012, open sourced in 2017. It's now available for artists to use in USD environments. And when first designed, it was made with purposely few presets because they wanted the artists to own it and uh, you know, keep the power with them so that they were the ones sort of pushing this, this initiative forward. That being said, that's not to say these presets aren't available. Because it's open source, a lot of artists have created their own presets and made them publicly available to folks. So um, if you're interested in that, you can check out more on their website. I wanted to pause and share this image because it's such a perfect representation of how open source can um, build something beautiful. This was made by a group of artists at Side Effects. They contributed to the open source project Material X and then rendered this final image out in Arnold. 
And again, there was no struggling to claim what program did what and, you know, who can claim the, the success of this image. It's bringing everybody's best strengths to the table and um, showing off the powers that we all have. There's room for everybody. Like I said, you can find out more information on materialx.org. That's their official documentation site. And um, you can learn more about presets, building your own presets, all of that good stuff. And before I hand it over to Sean for demos, I also wanted to call out a couple more projects that we are working on at Autodesk that are in alignment with uh, the USD movement. The first being LookDevX, which is a material authoring editor made with USD as its foundational technology. It's in a preview stage right now for Maya 2024. And as you can see, it mixes a, you know, a node-based workflow with a menu toggle-based workflow. So it accommodates many styles of working and preferences. Um, in general, when developing native materials, our focus is always going to be on in uh, interoperability, which is demonstrated by using Material X and then further illustrated by this LookDev X initiative as well. Um, it's not only intended for Maya, Max, and media entertainment products, it's intended to be usable by other DCs and formats as well. Next up is Arnold USD, which is accessible on GitHub and has a fully developed tool set, including shaders, shapes, lights, imagers, et cetera. Uh, it's all in on USD, and USD wants to represent everything that Arnold can render. It can export and import USD assets, including full shading, material assignments, render setups, and from any of the applications that Arnold supports, that applies to. That, again, not just Maya Max. We know that Arnold plugs into Houdini and Cinema 4D and has its own standalone. All of that applies to the USD standpoint too. And lastly, I wanna mention Bifrost USD. Bifrost is our visual programming tool for procedural 3D content and including simulations. It's got integration versions as well as standalone too. And it's available to download through your Autodesk account. We've been hammering away at this project since 2019, but as you can see, we made it open source in 2022. That was to be in alignment with the USD efforts again. Um, and we're excited to advertise a whole bunch of enhancements, what you see on the screen and stuff that I couldn't fit on this slide deck. So if you want to check out more or learn more, there's documentation online that will support you. And one last thing before I hand it off to Sean, um, I wanted to clarify that our team is also sort of operating in this USD mindset too. We used to have two separate teams for Maya and Max. Within that, they would work on their own tool sets like animation, modeling, rigging, all of that. But we've since shifted that structure to include or to focus on feature first. So there's one animation team, one modeling team, one rigging team, and those efforts benefit both Max and Maya simultaneously. That's not to say that the releases will be the same and everybody will get the same updates at the same time because we have different audiences and those audiences have different priorities but it will drastically reduce redundant efforts and make sure that we're not you know, paddling in different directions. And we're really excited about the progress we've made so far. And um, you'll see that in, throughout the next year as USD becomes more and more structured. Oh, with that, Sean, it's time to hand it over to you for some live demos. I'll let you do a quick intro. Hello, everybody. My name is Sean Olson. I'm the product owner for USD here at, at Autodesk, working on uh, both Maya and 3ds Max. And uh, I'm really excited to share some stuff with you. Uh, so my background, I've been here at Autodesk for around four years. Around Roughly around three of that, I've been working solely on USD. Uh, in the previous life, I was a, a generalist 3D artist and a technical artist, primarily focused on game development and making tools uh, for various communities. Okay, so now we're going to talk about USD. So uh, before I start sharing my screen, I'm going to just give you an intro of my first thoughts on USD. I have to admit, when I first heard about it, I wasn't very excited. I was like, ah, oh, great, another file format. And I'm sure a lot of you have kind of felt the same way and thought, well, it's just a file format. But as uh, Jordan mentioned earlier, it's a lot more than that. It has APIs and much more, and it even has entire paradigms and workflows that are really interesting, and especially if you like collaboration. And I'm going to try to show you uh, samples of how that might be interesting uh, for you and how you can do that. And I'm going to demo uh, working in 3ds Max, Maya, Houdini, and Unreal all at once. And uh, 
This is a live unscripted demo, so and I'm not a master at all of those. I have more strengths in others, some than others. But hopefully, uh, you know, you get some benefit out of this. I'm going to try to make this a value to both those who know nothing about USD and those who are just learning about it in a little bit. And also, if you're more advanced, maybe you can start learning about some of the opportunities that are, are available in our tools. So I'm going to jump to the end point of this demo to show you what we're going to get at and then show you how we got there. So here is a scene in Unreal. And I started with a collection of assets from Kitbash 3D. It's the Outpost Collection Kit. And this all started just a couple of days ago. It didn't exist at all. None of the assets existed as USD assets and packaged up into assets. None of it existed, and it didn't exist in any DCC at all other than an FBX file that I downloaded from Kitbash. So what I'm going to demo to you is some of the tools that are available of working with this. But here's a thing to note. This is all actual direct USD inside the scene. So Unreal, like the others, you're going to see it's got this stage. It's, it's the USD uh, term for uh, the world where you, you're putting all this stuff together. And this same exact data format you're going to see here is the same set of data format uh, that you're going to see in Maya and Max and in Houdini. And you're also going to say the same kind of things, um, uh, the properties that can be edited. So this is an important thing to understand that USD is bringing a common way to look at 3D environments, 3D scenes. And not only do you see here in Unreal, all of these that are called brims, they're just, it's a generic word for just things in the world, but you could think of them as nodes in, a, in your scenes. But there's also other concepts that are important to USD, and down here you're going to see layers. So I'm going to just show you that this same exact layer uh, paradigm exists over, we're going to use this over in Maya, but it's the exact same thing. So understanding that these are the same concepts is important because there's a common framework. So you can work, jump around. It makes people like me who don't really know a lot about every single DCC, I can still go in here because I know USD, start making some choices in USD land. So how did we get to this point? I'm going to minimize. I'm going to go to another DCC for the moment. I'm going to start in Max and talk about traditional workflows. So these are a couple of the models that were in uh, the Outpost kit again from Kitbash 3D. And in a traditional pipe, uh, traditional workflow, you might take select an object, and then you might do something that's very common. You go to an exporter, and you export it as something. And our exporter um, allows us to export some USD stuff. And then you just might hit export. And then you might go to the next thing and export it, and go to the next thing and export it. That's very nauseating, and we don't really want to work with that. Uh, so we want to provide tools that allow people to completely package up their assets however they want. So here's one thing that's important to know about our exporters in both Maya and Max. We allow you as a developer to go in, anyone can go in and actually kind of customize our exporter. So we do the, the grunt work for most of the basic translation, translating meshes, translating lights, where they're at in the world, the transforms, the materials, etc. But we also allow you to hook in and either take over entirely the export of certain types of objects in the scene, or just go in and append certain data that you need for your, your thing. So we have that with, uh, you can see here, Arnold's listed. Arnold is using this API, and it's the same between Max and Maya. We have the same capability. And then you can also, you can see this if you have certain versions of Chaos's uh, V-Ray installed, they're also using this API and developing on top of it. And you yourself, anyone can go in there and build on top of it. So if you're not a scripter, you might be like, well, that, that does that mean me? what does that mean for me? Well, you know, it allows people in the community to go in and make extra tools to wrap things up. And I'm going to show you an example of a little tiny tool that I, I prototype and put together to make my life easier to test our tools. So you're going to see here, there's a couple little items here. Um, USD helper ops asset and scene. These are a couple of the little ways that I hooked in and, and used our system to, to create what we're about to see here. I'm not going to actually export this because, I, like I said, I'm lazy. I don't want to do things manually like that. So instead, I like to build little tools that automate the systems. And this is stuff that anyone can do because our access to... Like I said, we have this way for you to ex uh, extend our exporters and our USD uh, 
integration entirely when you can do that in both Python and in uh, C++ in both of our applications. So what he, I have here is an example of the things that you can do. I'm only going to do this quickly, but then I'm going to show you jump forward to what it ended up being. So you might make a little tool that anyone out there scripting can do, and then you just create little example things in your scene that represents what is called a USD asset. And here I have something that represents what this will be in USD, and it introduces a concept that's really important, and that is variance. So one of the things I wanted to do is make sure all of the buildings could be swapped out once they're placed in the scene. You can do that by using variants, and that allows you in all of your different shots that you make using USD and this shot structure, which we'll talk about shortly, you can go make editorial choices on the fly without having to like swap it out with something else. The asset itself has its own definition. And in this case, I'm only changing out the, the mesh variants, but variants in USD are, are arbitrarily deep and, and you can make them as complex as you want. You can have mesh variants, you can have material variants, which are like skins in video games. And each variant can open up new variants, so variants can be nested. So you can create very complex assets. So in the end, I just wrote this little utility and then have a script that just takes any kind of FBX scene like those uh, kit bash scenes and automatically converts them into what you're going to see in this next scene here. And it just put all of them out in the scene, and then I have these, and I just started moving them out. I made a little landscape, and then I used tools that I'm used to, like Forest Pack, to scatter around the scene in the background, and that's how you saw it in Unreal. Um, those are all just instances of, uh, point instancer of a bunch of these things. So they're just scattered around through there using Forest. If I was using Maya for this, I would use something called Bifrost, which was mentioned earlier, which is a really cool procedural tool that we have a lot of integration with USD. Um, but I wanted to show this because I already have tools built up like this, and you can build your own little tools and, and extend. So once I got this, I used one of those extra exporters that I have that I showed the, the way to export this out into USD. And then it becomes available across the pipeline. It's no longer just max data. It's now entirely uh, USD data. So let me bring open Maya here. So here is that scene inside of Maya. So you can see there's all of our point instances, the city in the background, the landscape, and we have all of the prims here. And I can select different ones if I want to. I can move them around in the scene. And now here's an important understanding of how we can start really working together. So you can see over here this layer stack. And this layer stack determines, uh, it, it introduces a way to, to control and add opinions about how your scene is put together. At the very bottom layer, this layout.usda, this was the file that I exported from Max, and that was the one with the initial state of where all these things were and which variant was, was selected. And then on top of that, in, inside this layer stack, I have different layout layers, and they represent this layout.usd at the very lowest would represent a, a global um, set for this cityscape that's used across potentially multiple shows and multiple seasons. And it's the basic starting state for all of those. And then I might have another layer that's for the season because for that season, there may be particular changes that I'm making in that particular layer. And then I might have a particular show and an episode that I'm making a shot for. And then I made shot one in that show. So each one of these adds on top of the last. So I normally don't like to show text files but I'm gonna show you these because this is an important element of USD to understand how things are very sparse. Uh, it's called sparse, um, you can make sparse edits. So the base layer, this is the one with all of the, it's, it's very simple. Each of these prims is just defining a reference to some asset, what variant it's using and where it's at in the world. And all the other layers on top, they're referencing other layers at different points and they have no data in them yet. They will shortly because I'm going to make an edit inside of Maya and I'm going to show you how that propagates throughout the other DCCs. So layout show.usda is stronger than layout season and it, that is stronger than layout. So any changes I make in here is going to override any of the data that's in these basic settings. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click here and you're going to see this menu. And this is a context sensitive menu for 
uh, the selected prim, and it lets me make changes on this in USD land. So in this case, there's an option here, model variant. So this is asset has multiple variants. And I might just say, you know what? I want this to be that particular one. Or if I don't like that one, I might want it to go to a different one, whatever it is. Now, once I have what I want, you're going to see over here in Maya, there's this little icon that's letting us know that, oh, we've made an edit. And that edit is in this current target layer. You see the little asterisk here. If we want this to be sent back to the pipeline, all I got to do is save this. Now that file is saved on disk, just that layer, okay? So now let's see that same exact scene over inside of 3ds Max. And now I'm going to, before I even go into updating it, you're going to notice immediately like, wow, that's really garbled. Why is it like that? So that's another part of the script I made. It automates the creation of what's called proxies. So in order, one of the concepts in USD is to have different purposes. So the two common ones you would see is render and uh, proxy. And the proxy purpose is really intended to have be a low resolution version of your asset that will help improve performance in the viewport. Now, because my script was automated, I didn't visually check, so it's really garbled. You'd probably want to take time uh, actually kind of fine tuning them to be a little bit uh, less garbled than this, but at least I can get the general idea of what this looks like. But I can swap, this is a choice that you can do in any of your DCCs, what am I looking at, the proxy or the render? So I can switch back to the, the render purpose and see them like this if I want to too. But if it's laggy in my viewport, so right now I'm trying to move around, it's a little bit laggy. Well, then that's one reason why you might switch to using the proxy purpose, because now when I move around, I'm not being lagged. So let's go ahead and reload the um, that show layer. So I'm going to switch to that layer, and I'm going to say reload selected layer. And you're going to notice, I think it was this asset right here, it's going to update. Now, here's the important thing to remember. I didn't re-import this scene at all. I didn't do anything. The scene, all I did was reload that one layer. Now, let's go look at that one layer inside of uh, the text editor. And so now, all of a sudden, instead of it being just this top part, which I showed you earlier, Maya saved this one little tiny string and all it, this little chunk here. And these overs are saying it's overriding some data from below. So all it did was change the variant for that one model at that one place. So you can see you can start building up and constructing scenes and make changes that have very small file footprint uh, with this kind of override system. And then I can also, back in Max, do the same kind of thing if I'm in another layer and make a change. And I believe I should be able to do this. Let's uh, select this prim here. and. I should be able to change its uh, variant to something else. And let's save this layer. Save this selected layer. And let's go back over to Maya. Oop. And look over here where that asset was. And I should be able to see this one if I reload this layer, I think that's the one I did. Yep, you see the change right there. Again, we didn't re-import this whole scene. All I did was reload one little tiny layer, and it's only a very tiny thing. As long as I, I have access to that new layer data um, and I reload it, the updates will just happen. So that's a, a very important thing. I also want to go back um, a little bit earlier. Uh, Jordan had mentioned that we're spending a lot of time trying to bring together our teams and work on like common things. So you you saw this menu here, this right click menu, this context sensitive thing. So we've been spending a lot of time as a team building these workflows and these uh, APIs and technologies that, that we are actually sharing directly. So when you do update one, it actually goes directly in the other uh, DCC. I mean, we can't make everything automatically that way, but we're working as hard as we can to make these common workflows between our DCCs. So if I go back into Max, let's go back into this and open up our um, USD Explorer here. So we have their scene here with our Explorer of all the data, Scene Explorer. 
And again, I saw those, you can do these right-click menus. So the, the system we have that's all between all of our apps, we're using it, it's called UFE. It's called Universal Front End. Uh, you can see here that this exact same set of tools, it, it, we're just reusing the same stuff between Max and Mike. So we're, as we move forward, a lot of these workflows that we have that work with Prims and USD land are going to be able to just be shared. And you can share these common sets of, of ways with working with stuff. All right. So then you might even then have someone else in your pipeline that's using Houdini. And again, I am not a master of Houdini yet. Um, but it's really cool. But you can see here it's showing all of our proxies, and I could switch it to show the uh, the the render purposes as well. But you can see here again, it's a common way to look at the data. So again, just like in in Max and Maya, we have these menus to changing the variants and changing the different properties inside of the DCC. And I'm not going to save this back into um, directly into our layer stack, you've already seen that. But I can, if I was a, a Houdini guy, I could sit here and have these be piped back into whatever layers and do all kinds of procedural stuff. And then you just basically, you're able to now participate with all of the DCCs all at once in one system. And again, I could be even here in the in Unreal and making changes. I'm not gonna do it live because I happen to know that if I change a variant in here, it will kind of freeze my computer for a little bit. But it's really cool that you can see that you can start working back and forth between the tools and create some final, uh, final project with everyone working in tandem all at once. You can even get to this point. Again, I said, I told you that I was this scene didn't even exist at all a couple of days ago. And you could even, while I'm at this point, because the assets are at, atomicized and, and wrapped up into little packages, you can then still be iterating on them. And every time you update that particular asset, the results will propagate across your entire project, across all the DCCs all at once. And wow. uh, that's pretty much the extent of the demo I wanted to give today. This isn't everything about USD. There's a lot more to it. But I wanted to give you all a kind of a, a tour of the way you can start working with all the DCCs together using our tools today. Um, you can take advantage of the APIs we're building to extend our exporters and importers and work directly with the stage data. Um, like I was saying earlier, I just want to point this out one more time that we have you. We give you access to USD directly um, through Python and C++. And a lot of the like little functions you saw over here on the side, these actually are ones that were scripted. They don't exist in our tool yet. They're just experiments I've done. But it's only possible because we've exposed uh, directly direct access to the USD through Python and C++. So that is pretty much the the gist of what I wanted to share with all of you. And I'll I'll stop sharing now and open it up for questions and comments. Awesome. Let's throw some emojis in there for Sean. Live demos are not easy. So give it up for the, the USD wizard that we have with us today. Um, just to clarify, Sean, you mentioned that some of these things were on edge because your developer helped you, you prepare it for this demo, but the bulk of this presentation is available in Maya as it, Maya and Max as it exists today, correct? Oh yeah, there's a, there's a little feature in both of them that isn't yet publicly available. Um, so yeah, I have to mention that uh, there were a couple of things I did that you won't be able to do today. But we're con we're we've been updating. I can't give you promises on dates, but we've been trying to be releasing updates quite regularly with both of our DCCs. Uh, right now, Maya USD and Bifrost USD and Arnold USD are all uh, they're all done in open source so you can get them off the repo and even things that we don't have shipped you can just look at the prs and see what we're we're doing and you can get it and compile it yourself max is not currently open source but we are working hard to get it open source as well so that's a big priority for us uh, in the coming months and this question actually ties into that perfectly are you also communicating with other industries within autodesk about usd revit was specifically brought up in this question autocad was brought up in our other session can you speak to that relationship yeah we have people that are talking back and forth i have to say that my focus is primarily m e uh, but we do have like usd is big across autodesk and all the in all of the applications not just an m e yeah i mean 
everybody needs the ability to tell stories, right? So that extends to architecture and manufacturing. So I imagine that there will be interest uh, from those and that will grow quickly too. Um, there was a lot of excitement about the plugin you made for yourself. Is that available in any sort of way? Or can you can you give hints on how people can recreate that? So I, I will probably share this either myself or even us as a team to clean it up because it's just me experimenting and testing my team's stuff. So, but I, I think that we will share some, either it or something better. Um, um, in terms of material workflows, is there um, a list of existing materials that play nicely across our tools and other tools that are implementing USD, or is there um, a standardization coming in that regard? So, yeah, what you can export into USD is still kind of limited, but it's improving all the time. So it depends on which application. So you, the, your big thing is you should probably look at using Material X. That's kind of a, a big focus that we have. Um, you can, and also on that front, um, we have this thing called uh, LookDevX that's been developed over the last years. It's come out last year, it was, it was released in Maya. And again, it's built on UFE and, and we would like to, I can't make promises, dates or anything, but we're the intent is to bring this also into Max. But Look DevX allows you to build up Material X and even uh, Arnold shaders. And I just saw a uh, post online from the Chaos team. They're, they're um, integrating V-Ray with Look DevX. So you can build any shader directly in USD land through Look DevX and it's pretty awesome. Yeah, absolutely. But um, I guess I didn't answer the question. the The list is, uh, in, in Maya, it's I, I can't actually. Well, you know what? We'll we'll post something later to to make an actual definitive list. But I would stick with Material X uh, if you have if you're able to use that. Yeah, it's a safe bet for right now. Um, a couple of questions came in around game production. Um, is there a specific benefit to using USD as an export format over FBX at this point? So, you know, that's a, a loaded question. It depends on who you are and what you're doing. But I mean, I do want to point out that uh, Epic has been investing heavily and you just saw an example of that. They're integrating USD directly into Unreal. Um, so the the advantages or disadvantages are going to be entirely how you're using your assets and what kind of assets you're using. So if you need to use create package up an asset that has things like controllers and animation curves and things like that. Currently, that's a limitation in USD. It has uh, time sampled linear interpolated animations. It doesn't have um, complex things like animation curves and uh, controllers and constraints. So if that's a need of yours, you're going to have to still use FBX. But just on that note, Pixar is actively working on bringing animation curves into USD, and we intend uh, to support those as soon as they're available. You're reading my mind. I was going to ask about animation next. Um, does that, that that statement, does that also apply to physics, too? So I can't speak heavily about physics right now, um, so I'm going to bail on that question. I don't have a really good answer for that one. But we could always cash it out, right? And then... Uh, yeah, you it. can cash out your results into okay. animations. But again, you don't lose... The, you don't have the animation curves, uh, you know, and it's not... It's cached. It's not uh, real time. Uh, we did get a call out um, that said, were the assets you used from Kitbash all using exclusively Material X? So yes, I converted them all to Material X, correct? Thanks. And were you using a 3D mouse? Yes, I was. People are reading you, Sean. They're reading you. <laughs> uh, is there any support plan for Marvelous Designers or CLO? I can't answer that. I have I have no plans. There may I can't answer that. And LookDevX is open source, correct? So can people see that, or is it not uh, quite there yet? No, open or LookDevX is not open source. It's okay. included with Maya currently. Okay. Will there be plans to make it open source? Um, to my knowledge, there's no plans for that in particular. Um, but I'm not really the one in charge of those decisions. But I, I could not give you a definitive answer other than I know of no plans at this moment. 
keep those questions coming, folks. I think we we touched on a lot of them, but um, Sean, maybe you could speak to what the turning point for you was when you started learning about USD and you really saw the benefit of it. Maybe there's one area of a production that benefits more than the other that really sold you on it. Yeah, so for me, there's there's two things that got me excited about it. One was the variants and nested variant possibilities. So I only demoed mesh variants, but obviously you can make complex mesh variants. You can make material variants. You can make a variant of anything you want. Um, so that way, you know, building up an asset that can be used in multiple contexts is, you know, really important uh, for creating interesting scenes. So that was number one. And then once I finally understood how the, uh, the composition arc system in USD works. So there's this there's this an acronym in uh, USD called liver peas. Um, doesn't sound appetizing on your dinner plate, but you know, uh, it's it's really the, the an acronym that stands for layers, inherits, variants, etc. It goes down the the type of composition arcs that let you override and take control of the way the scene is composed. And once you understand that, you understand there's a ton of creative possibilities. And it also offers what, you know, I just demonstrated, I tried to demonstrate how you can have layers that override other layers and it's a non-destructive workflow. So things that were, I'm not really deleting people's uh, data down below on the stack. I'm just making a stronger opinion about it. And it's a really cool way to have non-destructive collaborative workflows, which is really exciting for anyone that likes to make projects with multiple people. Yeah, which I hope everybody does, right? Because we can't know everything. All of us have to work together at some point. Yeah. Um, can you speak to any of the USD features that are in beta right now that you're excited to see graduate into the next the next phase of their development? Yeah, so there are two things. On Maya right now, we're... Um, working on what's layer locking. It may not sound <laughs> really exciting, but so one of the, even as exciting as that layer stack is, you can get in trouble uh, because the edits where you you put things, you can get in trouble if you put your, if you target the wrong layer and you make a change and we want to keep people from making the, the edits in the wrong layer. So we want to make it a lot easier for the people to know where their edits are going and why they can't edit certain things and things like that. So that's one big thing that we're working on in Maya. And Max, you saw a very brief demo of that that we don't have yet available. And that is being able to pick a prim in the viewport. Um, we don't yet have that out in the public, but in my um, version that you saw here, I can pick and move a prim now, um, which is really cool. Yeah. When looking at those features and figuring out what to focus on in development, is the USD mindset more geared towards film or is it games oriented or is it trying to share both of those those headspaces? Well, USD was born in film, so I think it's naturally more film, but the game industry has been um, you know, coming on board. A lot of our customers, uh, some of the bigger studios are really embracing and moving a lot of their stuff. I personally look at both you of game and film and anything 3d is i think that the industries are converging all around you know it's the same stuff i i have a thing in 3d space i move it you know i have to put a material on it you know it's the same general concepts um so i think they're converging um, year by year yeah absolutely especially with all the developments that game engines are having too uh this is a good one for simultaneous simultaneous collaboration how does that work? How do you prevent crashing? How do you make sure that, you know, when you both have the file open, things don't blow up because it has happened before. Okay. So one, you don't use fresh off the press versions of a software that was not tested like I did today. That's number one, to not <laughs> fresh. But um, so that's, so when it comes to the, the, the layer stack, really each person, like you can open up the same root stage you, you know, that's how you know you're working in the same exact environment, but nobody should be working on the same layer at the same time. So you should always, you know, and that's where layer locking will come in. Um, users can lock themselves out of layers once we get this, but it will also show you if it's locked on disk. So, you know, there's different levels to this. There's, you know, our DCCs locking things, but there's also the operating systems locking files and asset management systems. It A lot of that can come into play. Um, 
but you do have to be careful. You don't want two people to be working on the exact same layer at the exact same time. Right. And that those um, sort of controllers and permissions levels, is that set by an admin or can an artist sort of lock out their own layer? So we're working on two levels to that. So US, we're not actually introducing anything new to USD itself. USD has uh, two layers of locking um, on layers. It's called set permission to edit and set permission to save. So we're exposing to the, the user the set permission to edit so that they can lock themselves out. But we're not exposing to the user the set permission to save. We're leaving that up to the TDs or the file write permission on disk. Yeah, the TD component makes me think of asset management too. Are there, I'm sure there's ongoing conversations about how asset management and USD play nicely together too. Uh, yeah. Are you involved in those discussions as well? Yeah, to to an extent, I'm on the periphery. We're doing uh, explorations here at Autodesk on asset management. Um, the thing is, G USD, like any other environment where you're creating assets, it's there's nothing really super special about USD and an asset. It's just an asset. Whether it's a texture or a USD file, it's still an asset. And so asset management is always important when you have projects with multiple people and you want to version things over time and control who can edit or not. Um, but it's important to USD, but it's not 100% a USD thing. It's just a, a, a production thing in general, you know. Sure, making sure that that, I assume that the assets would display the same if we integrate ShotGrid into a DCC tool that is usually USD data, correct? Well, you would hope so. Yeah, <laughs> so, <okay>. yes. <laughs> cool. Uh what about the construction infrastructure realm? Can collaboration between different disciplines and programs like AutoCAD, Revit, Inventor take advantage of USD? We touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, yeah. I don't think that our team is responsible for that initiative, no. over there, right? but we can dangle the carrot in front of them. Is that fair to say? Yeah. I mean, I guess, so interop is important and, D, and USD provides a type of interop, but I think it is important for people to understand that just USD is not some panacea that solves all things. Um, for example, um, if you want to, it, it doesn't have a, a, a way to compute a construction cookbook of something like in Bifrost or Houdini, where you have these complex graphs that, that make something it is cached out. So if you want to just take any asset and move it from one DCC or one application to another, those things, if you're wanting to edit, edit them in a collaborative way entirely back and forth, you are kind of limited to what is understood entirely by the, and right now that is only what's available in USD. If there's extra stuff that's part of a construction history or a complex procedural system, you still are, you're still going to have to stay within the application that understands the, the cookbook essentially that made that asset. For example, Bifrost, that would mean you have to be inside of Maya with Bifrost, et cetera. Um, within that, proxies, is there a limit on how many proxies you can use before crashing becomes common? I don't think there's a hard limit on that because it's probably per proxy, you know, how yeah. how complex is your proxy? How much memory do you have? You know, mm -hmm. are you using instancing or not? You know, there's a lot of that. Yeah. Did you get the latest and greatest version of the software this morning? That, that sort of deal, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, with Material X being an integral part of USD workflows moving forwards, is Material X projected to see some updates in 3ds Max? So Max, we did add the Material X material that lets you load Material X uh, directly in Max, and our exporter will export a reference to those Material X files. Um, as far as actual Material X workflows, I would expect, again, I, I can't make promises about the future and our exact plans and what we're going to do, but um, I would expect and like to see uh, LookDevX come into our USD workflows in the future because it has all of these Material X um, capabilities right now. Absolutely. Are there any other open source projects that have caught your eye recently? My eye? Um, yeah. nothing in, I'm, I'm pretty much heads down in USD so much. I don't even get up to look too much anymore. Um, I'm not sure. 
someone's going to probably smack me for that later, but. <laughs> uh, do you subscribe to a newsletter or do you just go poke around GitHub every once in a while if, when you have non-USD time on your time hands? Yeah. <sighs> Poking around, I live under a rock. Otherwise, other uh, <laughs> other than being here at Autodesk and working on what we're doing. Cool, uh, Sean. Is there any limitation on how many people can work in the same file? Even with the reload button, it might cause crashing. Is that correct? So, I mean, you don't want to like. So, everyone should be working on their own layers. That's the the primary issue. Um, so, no one should be working on the same layer at the same time. In fact, um, to help facilitate people not doing that, we've been doing some work in Maya um, to bring around more obvious layer locking tools that artists can lock and then the studios can lock and people won't accidentally be working on the same layers at the same time. Um, but I mean, I don't know of any specific hard limit, but it, it really should be as many people as you need Okay. If you break it, let us know, right? That sort of situation. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and you answered this one already, I believe, in the Q&A, but I think it's important to bring it up too. Will USD find its way into other Autodesk CAD software? This would enable use for USD in digital twins in other industries in combination with product visualization and expand the range of applications. Um, speaks to yeah. the vision of USD, which I think is important too. Yeah, I mean, I, Autodesk is investing heavily in USD across the board. I can't speak specifically, especially about the future, but I do know that a lot of our products, even on the A and E side, are uh, are embracing USD. That's great. Again, we're playing nice with others, including programs within our own house. Um, this question is about animation. Obviously, there's game exporter compatibility, but can you speak to how USD functions in terms of animation clips? So, um, anime, animation clips specifically, I don't know if I can give a, a, a very good answer, but, um, you know, you, animation is one of those things that is a aha for a lot of people because as of today, USD doesn't have what's called animation curves. So everything is baked down, which a lot of times in game context might be okay. But if you want to re-edit those things later, uh, it becomes a problem. Right now, Pixar is working on bringing animation curves into USD, which should you know unlock some of the work of animating in the context of USD directly. But even that still leaves a lot um, off the table because you know you, you for characters and stuff you want to could control rigs, uh, constraints, controllers, that kind of thing, and that's still not part of USD. Um, so. It, it, there's some room to grow in animation directly, but that that being said, you know when you're creating productions and you're cashing out your animations, USD is great for that. It's wanting to come back and re-edit those things, then that becomes the area where, uh, if you want to transport, a, say, a character with a control rig and certain animations and animate that same thing across multiple DCCs, that is still a, a kind of a weak point at the moment with USD. It's coming though. It's not too far away. It's obviously yeah. on, and, on the dock. Yeah, and it, as soon as as soon as uh, Pixar has that in USD, you know, we are going to add in. I, I can't actually. Let me take that back. I can't tell you what we are or are not going to do, but we do intend to um, bring uh, animation curve support for USD into Max and Maya. Yeah, and development's happening so fast with USD. I, I can't imagine that we'll have to wait very long. So, so you're stay tuned, everybody. Plug from me. Uh, all right, sort of on that same theme, is there any benefit to using USD format for building a library? Even if there's no interop between DCC tools, is there an advantage to keeping everything in the U USD format? Yeah, so for me, it's the, the, the most obvious one in my, this is just my opinion, is the variance, because um, you can package your assets up in a really cool way with the variants that allow you to make a lot of choices with those, no matter what context you're in. So that that's one thing that even if you're not in a big pipeline, having organized assets with variant sets and one interesting, I didn't demonstrate this, um, but it would, it's really interesting is that you can have multiple variant sets in your, in your assets and they can be nested. So an obvious one would be a variant set with 
different meshes, which I did demonstrate here, but you could also do one where it has different meshes and it has different materials and each of the material you can swap out, the, like in a game, you, you swap out the skins. Um, and then you can also have variants that unlock new sub variants. Um, and it's an infinitely recursive. It's really cool. Yeah. This question kind of relates to that too. Uh, for layers though, Lay can layers contradict each other? And how does one avoid that? How do you assign power to layers? Okay. So there's a very, your, your kids might think it's an unappetizing thing, but it's called liver peas. Um, <laughs> it's an acronym that stands for layers. It's just an acronym for the type of rules in USD. But anyway, it's the, that set of rules determines what wins, whose opinion is the loudest. So uh, the higher on the layer stack, the stronger you are. So anything below, if there's an opinion above it that that changes that opinion, the the higher layer wins. Yeah, okay. And that doesn't apply to variants, right? Variants are all on equal level within that layer. Within that layer, but you can have a, an opinion on a higher level of that. You can change the variant on a higher level. Okay. How do Python versus C++ compare in terms of of ways in which one can get involved developing applications for USD? One outrank the other? Uh, well, it depends on who you're going to ask. Um, <laughs> so, you know, uh, <laughs> this is a personal opinion. Um, for me, uh, I think Python is easier, but obviously C++ has performance gains. Um, with our tools, you get to pick and choose which is the best for you. Um, if performance is truly your issue, your concern, you want to go with C++, but if performance is not at the top of your list and getting the, the tool done as fast as possible, probably Python. Well, uh, covered a lot of these just intermittently. Um, one question was brought up regarding UNC paths. Um, does USD support when working with Windows and a Linux mixed environment? And can you speak to how that would be applied in a studio? Yeah, I mean, it, it can. There are caveats. There are problems um, in USD itself, saving files in some contexts. I can't even tell you at the top of my head exactly those scenarios. Um, sometimes um, USD has a problem thinking that it's allowed to write to different network locations. But generally speaking, you can work in those contexts. But um, uh, every I'm not going to speak generally because I, I've known working with USD for the last three years that people have brought up different issues. Um, some people are, are working fine and some people are finding problems. But I think that's network based on the individual networks and how they're set up. So that's a I'm blowing the question off, I guess. Yeah, well, there's no way that we can know every single network setup, right? So, yeah. yeah, but that doesn't mean that you all shouldn't share those results with us. So if you're running into issues, please join the open source project and share that, um, share that scenario so that we can address it. Um, this one is tied back to your demo. Are the proxy exports coming from the tool that was created by Sean, or is that something that happens automatically with USD? Okay, so those were tools that I prototyped. Um which for uh, I'll probably release those if I clean them up at some point um, on, on some Git repo or something. But it's nothing rocket science that I did. It's actually pretty straightforward. And then also we're working on uh, some tools in Bifrost to do the same kind of things. Um, so yes, I did write those, but um, it's not rocket science. The shiny version will come out soon. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, how about training for workflows in USD? Where's the best place to find that, in your opinion? Well, <laughs> I, I don't really have a great answer for that. I mean, I, I've randomly seen stuff. For me, it's getting in there and playing with it. That's how I learned. So everyone's different. Um, the, the Pixar, if you're a person that likes to read docs, I know a lot of people aren't. The Pixar docs are really good. Um, Houdini has a lot of good information. Their docs on... Um, working with USD there. Um, just uh, Google is your best friend, I think. Yeah, YouTube University, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, we're about at time, but Sean, do you have a one sentence or two sentence elevator pitch for folks that are maybe dragging their feet to getting started with USD? 
Well, I mean, it depends on who you are, but I, I think everyone across the industry has realized the, the value of it, most of the studios. So it is coming to be the standard that the, the entire, all the industries are looking towards for data exchange for 3D scenes. So I just wouldn't uh, put your head under a stone and recognize that it has it is going to be the future. Um and then there's a lot of really cool opportunities. If you love collaboration, which you know I think most of us do, it opens a door for collaboration, which is something that I think all creatives really want and all and all studios really need for efficiency's sake. So, well, let's go. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>